this is, uh, um, you know, as others have eloquently mentioned before, you know, I'm, I'm here to take credit for the work of many others. And this is, um, you know, uh, my core team, um, which um, you might notice uh, is heavily weighted in, in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the gender um, <laughs> distribution toward, toward women. So, um, and I understand, you know, there are folks in this group who, um, um, appreciate you know the promotion of, of women in data science so um, I'm very proud to work with such a competent uh, uh, team of collaborators um, we also have a number of uh, advisors um, working in related areas um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually I'm going to kind of go kind of quickly because um, I have like an hour's worth of stuff to tell you in about 18 minutes um, so I hope you had coffee um, so again, um, you know, there's this idea that there's a complementarity uh, between what machines and humans can do. And so, um, um, you know, we kind of anticipate that over time, as AI methods improve, that they will uh, progressively be able to do more and more of what humans can do today. And we're seeing that happen. And, and I think, you know, Eric's doing some of the most substantive, substantive work that I've seen in the area, for example, in terms of, of, of acquiring uh, real-world knowledge about physics just through through um, um, machine-based learning. Um, one thing, though, just as sort of a, a thought experiment to you, um, the most interesting things to me about Eric's talk um, were not what the machines could do, but what the humans did. So he showed a slide um, of the patient record, and he said, you know, this particular observation um, uh, uh, having to do with the intestines and 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 um, the presence of, of uh, you know, the drugs that tend to, to slow that stuff down um, led us to do this other investigational study. Well, it took a human to actually notice this thing, recognize that there was an anomaly there, and more importantly, realize that that was an important anomaly. There were probably lots of anomalous, spurious kinds of things, but one of them mattered. And why is it that the human had to be in the loop to figure that out? Why couldn't a machine figure that out? What's missing in terms of what machines can do? Um, so, and the other example that I thought was worth mentioning is, um, you know, with that wind mapping thing. So, we have these gems, hidden gems, but it takes a human to realize that they're hidden gems and figure out what to do with them. Why human and not machine? So, that's food for thought. Um, so, anyway, we believe that, you know, in the future, maybe AI can, can do some amazing things and solve problems for us that we can't solve today, but, but today, right now, we can take the best of what we've got in AI, and we can take humans, um, which today exhibit the most human-like intelligence, and have them actually work together. Um, and we wanted to take um, this approach and apply it to a real-world problem. And um, serendipitously, at the time that we were looking for uh, a problem, I was introduced to a biomedical researcher at Cornell University named Chris Schaefer, um, who um, was studying a particular aspect of Alzheimer's disease. And is, and had made some important discoveries related to brain blood flow. So we've known since the beginning of Alzheimer's disease that there's about 30% uh, less brain blood flow in Alzheimer's patients um, than in healthy brains, uh, but we've never understood why. And um, so uh, the, the important discovery is that um, it was, it's these tiny blood vessels in the brain called capillaries um, that were found to be stalled at a higher prevalence rate in Alzheimer's, uh, in mouse models of Alzheimer's disease um, than in the wild type mice. And, um, and then it was sort of uh, like 2% in the Alzheimer's mice versus half a percent of capillary stalls in the wild type mice, which doesn't sound like a big difference. But then when they looked at the downstream effects, the overall reduction in brain blood flow was actually about 30% due to those stalls. Um, and, um, and the other important discovery they made um, quite serendipitously and accidentally, um, was that uh, introducing uh, an immunosuppressant, uh, it was actually, they were just using it as a way to sort of, um, to, to tag some things they were looking at microscopically, but it had this unintended effect of um, releasing the stalls. So that suggested that there was an immunologic response causing the stalls, which ultimately was, was um, uh, connected to the, 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 the hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease, which is the amyloid uh, oligomers. Um, so, um, um, you know, in, in, in further studies, they found that, that restoring the, the, the blood flow to the brain in these mice actually restored the mouse memories, um, reduced other cognitive symptoms, depression, 
Um, uh, and, uh, and so it looked uh, like a promising uh, avenue for, uh, for additional research. So, um, so there are a number of research questions that need to be asked um, that all involve counting these, these stalls in, in the mouse brains. Um, the problem they had is that in conducting a single experiment, they would generate so much data that it would take six months to a year to answer a single research question, which is, of course, a, um, you know, a, a glacial pace when it comes to, to research. So this wasn't uh, very practical. Um, so, um, and I'll, I'll sort of cut to the chase. Um, we figured out that we could sort of crowdsource this data analysis task. So we created an online game that anyone can play called Stall Catchers. And, um, and by playing the game, um, uh, you're not a subject in the experiment. You're actually analyzing the data um, uh, you know, along with uh, or, or on behalf of, of the scientists. Um, so we have about um, um, 12,000 um, people registered in stall catchers. Uh, this is what it looks like to play the game. So we show you um, a virtual microscope. Uh, we stole this interface from the Stardust at Home project, and we adapted it with their help. And the idea is that um, you look inside the outline, um, add an individual capillary, and you just have to make a single binary force choice decision about whether the blood vessel is flowing or stalled. And that's how you play the game. Um, so, um, so we have, like I said, 12,000 registered users day to day. You might see 50 to 100 people playing the game. Um, we have the usual sort of distribution of kind of like, you know, sporadic users, periodic users, and super users. Um, today we're, we're analyzing the data about three times faster than in the lab. So, um, so now we can answer research questions in two to three months instead of uh, six months to a year. And for this reason, the researchers are actually asking questions they otherwise wouldn't have been able to ask because of the, the, the high cost of analyzing the data. So they're actually doing more research and asking um, more in-depth questions than they otherwise would have been able to. Um, Stall catchers is the first and only collective intelligence system for Alzheimer's uh, research data. Um, and we have some research results. Um, recently, uh, the community uh, finished analyzing a data set. It was about 105,000 um, capillaries um, from something like uh, you know, 30 animals. And um, the question was whether or not uh, regardless of, of whether the mouse has Alzheimer's disease or not, whether having a high-fat diet would increase the incidence of stalls. And, um, and so the, the preliminary result, uh, this hasn't been vetted by the Cornell lab yet, but is, you know, and it's very statistically strong because of the, the amount of data, um, is, is that there's, uh, you know, quite higher stall rate uh, with a high-fat diet. Um, so... Um, the current data set in stall catchers is asking uh, more about the upstream uh, molecular mechanisms that might be implicated in this stalling uh, process, uh, because if we can interrupt that safely, then we could um, you know, uh, potentially uh, pursue a treatment that does the same thing in humans um, and, and restore blood flow to the brain, which hopefully would alleviate the cognitive symptoms. Um, stall catchers has also had this ancillary effect, uh, which um, the wired journalist thinks maybe is, is the, one of the most powerful effects is that, uh, you know, it, it's a very hopeless and helpless feeling disease. And so it gives a reprieve to caregivers um, and even patients who play the game. Uh, and, and they can feel like they're making an impact uh, in the research that could help them within their own lifetime. Um, so this is, um, you know, sort of the substance of what I wanted to talk about here uh, because um, this involves... Um, you know, the generous uh, uh, compute time uh, from our Azure grant, and, uh, and we've made, I think, pretty good use of that time. So um, there are different sort of human-machine partnerships that we've had in this project. Um, originally, so, 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 there, so I'll just go over the three basic components. So first of all, we have to figure out where are all the blood vessel segments in the images and then draw an outline around them, because that's the only way we can show a human <laughs> This is the one you're supposed to look at. This is the one you're supposed to annotate. Um, we get really noisy data sets. Sometimes we get arterioles or venules that are huge, and we draw these you know, weird outlines that really don't mean anything. 
and then um, it's wasting people's time because they get served one of these videos and they're trying to annotate it. They don't know what it is or what to do with it. We have a mechanism that allows them to flag bad movies, but it's still wasting their time. So um, we um, you know, are exploring machine-based approaches to, to doing that. And then ultimately, um, uh, we have to do a classification. We have to count how many vessels are flowing and how many are stalled in order to answer uh, the research questions. So um, at the beginning of the project, we actually thought we were going to have to create two different crowdsourcing platforms, um, one to find the vessel segments and one to do the classification. And um, for finding those um, vessel segments, we, want, we had to come up with some way to automatically trace the vasculature in, in these um, 3D image stacks. And so we were going to um, beg, borrow, and steal from the iWire platform, which is used to trace um, you know, the retinal neurons, and try to adapt that to, to the vasculature. And, and uh, ultimately, though, um, we sent one of our team members to Princeton to study for a week with Sebastian Sung, who created iWire, and learn about their convolutional neural network methods and how they were automatically doing a lot of the segmentation for iWire and then taking that last bit that the, that the neural networks couldn't do. And that's what was um, put into the iWire game. So Muhammad came back, and um, he actually, um, uh, yeah. oh, so I don't know why this is this part of this. So this is just to say, you might recognize this face in the room. Um, so the way we, it was actually right at that time. That's why it's right here. So it was right at that time that Muhammad came back and he said, oh, I think I can solve this problem. Um, using convolutional neural networks, and then we don't need a whole other game to do it because you know there's sort of this ethical um, obligation. We don't want to waste human time if a machine can do it. Um, so it was around that time that that Leah, who knew about the Eyes on Owls project, mentioned it to Vani, and then Vani contacted us and said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there so you can take the picture." Um, and um, it, you know, and then sort of the, the rest, you know, Vani was very supportive and, and, and then kind of helped us get underway. So we could, and she fast-tracked us, which was great because um, we were really in a hurry to do this because we had a user community that we were building and doing it the old-fashioned way was taking a long time. They were hungry for data, and this allowed us to um, develop and test these automated, um, you know, these automated methods. Um, so then um, my other colleague, um, uh, Yeva, uh, I'm not even going to try to say her last name. I've known her for three years, and I still can't say her last name. But um, she's done most of the uh, software development and, and a lot of the, the, the data science work, including uh, this machine learning stuff. And she came up with a model to automatically detect these sort of what we call bad vessel movies and clean out the data set using this. So this was another way that we use the compute resources on Azure. Um, was to automatically um, detect these different varieties and also to classify and taxonomize um, and, and keep track of how many of these were occurring. Um, so, um, yeah, sometimes we're, we're sort of whimsical. And, and um, so you've probably heard of Galaxy Zoo, this other citizen science project where you go classify galaxies. Um, so this is actually, this is not the deep sky survey. This is. Um, from our blood vessel data. But a lot of these things look like galaxies, so we did a galaxy classification of the blood vessels. Um, in any case, um, um, you know, the, so we've achieved 92% accuracy in, in cleaning up the data um, and removed um, about 20% of the movies. So that's speeding up what the humans can do by about 20%. And, um, and the 92% is good enough. We just need to validate that, that, that it, there's no selection bias in that 90%. Um, so you know, the, the final aspect is this, this classification task, which is what the stall catchers game does. And um, you know, the basic idea here is, of course, they tried using machine learning first. And, and the machine learning algorithms could classify flowing versus stalled and get it right about 80 85% of the time. So. Um, and they were using the best off-the-shelf computer vision algorithms at the time. And, and, and any time something new would come out, they would try it. So th the problem is this, that um, the value in the crowd is not that individual members of the crowd are better than the machine algorithms. It's just that they make different mistakes. We're, we're, we're all different. 
and there's diversity in our cognitive styles and approaches. So, you know, when you have three, you know, machine learning algorithms that are all the same algorithm, they're all going to make the same mistake. So it doesn't matter if you try to combine results from three different uh, algorithms. Um, on the other hand, um, you could have three humans, each of which is underperforming the machine learning algorithm, but in combination um, and in aggregate, you can have something that's very expert-like. Um, there, there, I think one of the talks uh, since we were here um, was about um, combining different machine algorithms, and that's an interesting approach as well to this kind of problem, and one that we're actually we're going to run a competition, and we'll see what, how much more we can do with machines. So the question for us was, how many humans do you need uh, to combine to answer about a single vessel and have expert-like performance? Um, we used some just very basic averaging methods um, at the beginning, and we had to hit these very high sensitivity and specificity numbers. So we realized that you know, as we increased the number of annotations, it wasn't until we got to 20 annotations for an individual vessel that we had expert-like performance. That's a lot of human eyes on just one vessel, and it didn't feel very efficient. So um, you know, we continued to refine our methods, and uh, we think we're close to the theoretical limit, but we were able to, through um, and I won't go into the details of it, but to come up with a more dynamic uh, method that involves some, some weighting and monitoring of individual performance to get it down to about seven people um, per, per vessel. Um, so, so ultimately, we were able to validate our approach. And, um, and so then they gave us real data to analyze, and then something happened. We gave them our results uh, from the analysis, and then the lab said, you know, um, we gave you a data set that hadn't been analyzed, but we actually kept part of it and analyzed it ourselves just to double check you. There's not really strong agreement between what you're giving us and what we came up with. So we sat down with them, and um, we realized that um, we actually had better agreement between our crowd um, and um, their individual experts, particularly when you looked at only the vessels where there was consensus between their experts and our crowd. And then in the remaining vessels where there was disagreement, um, we, uh, we sort of talked about each one. And ultimately, they agreed that, um, uh, that they had been wrong and that the crowd was right. So we, we felt sort of you know, vindicated um, about that. And we like to brag about that. Um, so, so now we're well underway. Like I said, we have these new data sets in the process. And we also realized that. Even though it takes humans um, using this approach to achieve the kind of uh, accuracy that we need, um, that there might be some very easy um, blood vessels where a machine-based system could, with almost perfect accuracy, do the annotation. So then it was a question of, can we come up with a way for the machine to not only classify blood vessels as flowing or stalled, but also tell us how confident it is about its result and do that reliably? And so another way that we're sort of innovating in the machine learning space, um, and by we, I mean Yeva, <laughs> is to, um, you know, to, to build and test models like this um, on um, Azure. And, um, and so far, um, you know, in, our, in our early um, efforts, we've been able to uh, classify 5 or 10% of the vessels with perfect accuracy using a machine-based method. So that's, again, 5 or 10% fewer vessels that humans need to look at. So, so the overall impact of the work we've done with our initial Azure grant um, over a six-month to a year period of time was to um, completely remove this other bottleneck of, of tracing the vascular vasculature using automated systems. Um, we've um, removed 20% um, of the movies which were bad. And um, we're, uh, we believe, um, we haven't uh, put this into our pipeline yet, but, but it looks like we'll be able to at least reduce the human load by around 10% in terms of the vessels that need to be annotated. Um, so you know, half our work is in terms of engaging the community, and the other half is improving the efficiency of our platform. And the combination of those two things um, uh, addresses our bottom line, which is analytic throughput. All we care about is getting to um, a, a treatment target faster. And, um, and so um, you know, through our, through our um, data science efforts, um, you know, we, we focus on this analytic, uh, uh, on, sorry, on the um, improving the efficiency of, of, this, of the platform. Um, so, um, 
so the, you know, the work we want to do next is, is basically to, um, um, to improve the sensitivity, sensitivity and specificity of our auto tracing. So we're not auto tracing perfectly right now, um, which means that if we get an image stack that has 1,500 vessels, maybe we're only using 1,000 of those. If we can improve that, then we can squeeze more data um, and then maybe um, the, the lab scientists don't have to collect as much imagery, so that can speed up the research further. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we need to make sure that, that as we remove bad movies that we're not, um, um, you know, sometimes we have false positives in that, and that, um, that those false positives aren't pulling out more stalled vessels than flowing vessels, that there's not a selection bias there. Um, and we really want to um, as I mentioned, you know, through sort of introducing more and different kinds of machine-based algorithms, possibly in combination, um, start to increase the proportion of uh, classification that's being done by machines so the humans really are doing less work and focusing on only the very most challenging problems. Um, and, and we're always seeking to improve uh, the efficiency of our wisdom of crowd methods. So even though we think we're near the theoretical limit, we think there's room for, uh, there's always possibly room for, for improvement there. Um, and the other thing is that we've been approached by, by researchers in other disease research areas who realize that our platform could be applied to their data. Um, so um, there's a researcher at University of Pittsburgh who's got huge data sets of sickle cell anemia data. The difference there is that instead of looking for flowing or stalled blood vessels, um, they want people to pick out what are called torturous vessels. So instead of being vessels that have a nice kind of flowing shape, they're sort of all twisted up. That's, I think, the hallmark of the, the sickle cell. Um, so um, uh, I guess the, the last thing I'll say is that um, we've set our sights big. We do a lot of um, uh, sort of community engagement events. Um, sometimes they're, they're synchronized what we call catchathons, where everyone plays stall catchers for the same exact one hour period of time all over the world. We've done two international catchathons, and, and it's been a great way to, to build our community and, and generate a lot of excitement around what we're doing. Um, we, we're aiming high. Um, we're going up a couple orders of magnitude here, but we've, we have a lot of reasons to believe we can do this. We're aiming for April 13th of 2019. What we want to do is gain a engage 100,000 participants all at the same time, all within the same one hour period, primarily through uh, libraries and schools where we have some inroads. Um, we're creating a meetup capability that'll bring people together in those venues uh, for that time. We want to analyze an entire research data set that would normally take six months or a year uh, and answer a single research question in that one hour. Um, and we fortunately, uh, We'll have a lot of help uh, in doing that. Uh, so that's it. Thank you.